Technological talk is everywhere nowadays. All manner of novel developments, good or ill, are associated with the supposed impact of technology. And an awful lot of these technologies you hear people talking about are media technologies. But when we invoke the term technology, whether in relation to media or in general, just what do we mean anyway? Do technologies drive human history? Or are technologies just tools produced by and extending deeper cultural structures? Media Technology and Culture is a podcast series by me, Scott Rogers. In this series, we'll be taking a thematic look at media, understood as technologies. We explore the histories of media, as well as more recent developments, and not always necessarily in a linear progression. Some of you listeners will also be students in my module, Media Technology and Culture, in which we'll discuss and work on these themes in more detail. This episode serves as an introduction to the whole series. The main idea I want to get across in this episode is this. The technological and cultural aspects of media are in a chicken and egg relationship. You cannot reduce one to the other, nor can there be one without the other. The most useful position is arguably somewhere in between. Of course technologies are cultural, but culture is also inherently technological. To begin to unfold this idea, I want to start with something called medium theory. You've no doubt heard about Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian theorist of media. In some ways, he was a celebrity intellectual, often appearing on the key medium he studied, television. He was not only known to be provocative, but also often confusing, contradictory, fickle, sarcastic, patronizing, conservative, especially owing to his Catholicism, and even a little insecure. Some saw him as a serious philosopher. For others, he was not to be taken too seriously. A label often applied to McLuhan's style of media theory, and others such as Harold Innes and Neil Postman, is medium theory. This label was not used by McLuhan, but applied after the fact by Joshua Merowitz. Writing in 1994, when media studies was overwhelmingly focused on the interpretation of media representations, Merowitz sought to reassert the value of thinking and studying the characteristics of mediums as such. McLuhan's best-known book is Understanding Media, first published in 1964. By academic standards, it was a bestseller, around 100,000 copies sold. If you've read it, you may find this hard to believe, but it was supposedly written in clearer language than his earlier, also well-known 1962 book, The Gutenberg Galaxy. Understanding media arguably made McLuhan the definitive scholar of the media, though maybe at a cost, with McLuhan often being seen as a pseudo-intellectual. McLuhan's long and slightly absurd celebrity phase was perhaps capped off when he made a cameo in Woody Allen's 1977 film, Annie Hall. Allen plays a divorced television writer, and in the scene, he's standing in line at the cinema. He's listening painfully to a university lecturer behind him, who is by our standards today, at least, sort of mansplaining McLuhan's work to the woman he's with. Eventually, Allen breaks the fourth wall and addresses the film's audience directly. What do you do when you get stuck well, on a movie line with a guy like this behind you? Wait a minute, why can't just I give my maddening. opinion? This is a free country. He, he, he can give you, you have yeah. to give it so loud. I mean, aren't you ashamed to pontificate like that? And, and the funny part of it is, Marshall McLuhan, you don't know anything about Marshall McLuhan's oh, really? work. really, really. I happen to teach a class at Columbia called TV, Media, and Culture. So I think that my insights into Mr. McLuhan, well, have a great deal of validity. Oh, do you? Yeah. Well, that's funny because I happen to have Mr. McLuhan right here. So, so, yeah, just let me, let me, let me, come over here a second. Oh, Tell I, heard, I heard what you were saying. You, you know nothing of my work. You mean my whole fallacy is wrong. How you ever got to teach a course in anything is totally amazing. McLuhan's most famous dictum was, the medium is the message. Put simply, McLuhan worried that too much media research was fixated on the content found in media. His argument was that those who truly wanted to understand media needed to pay greater attention to studying how the mediums themselves worked. This was the real message of media. It was a proposition he often set out rather, shall we say, provocatively. As he put it in an interview with Playboy magazine, yes, Playboy magazine, quote, The content or message of any particular medium has about as much importance as the stenciling on the casing of an atomic bomb, end quote. Or, in understanding media, quote, Our conventional response to all media, namely it is how they are used that counts, is the numb stance of the technological idiot. 
For the content of a medium is like the juicy piece of meat carried by the burglar to distract the watchdog of the mind. The effects of technology do not occur at the level of concepts or opinions, but alter sense ratios or patterns of perception steadily and without any resistance, end quote. Because he uses the term medium, McLuhan may seem to be referring to individual media technologies. However, it'd be more accurate to say that he means to refer to the ecology or environment that is produced by a medium. Well, Professor McLuhan, uh, I think we better deal with um, the uh, medium as the message before it does go into the ah. 21st century. Uh, when you say the, the medium is the message, does that leave any room at all for criticism of individual, say, television programs? Or content. Um, yes. <clears throat> you see, it doesn't much matter what you say on the telephone. The telephone as a service is a huge environment, and that is the medium. And the environment affects everybody. What you say on the telephone affects very few. And the same with radio or any other medium. What you print is nothing compared to the effect of the printed word. The printed word sets up a paradigm, a structure of awareness, which affects everybody in very, very drastic ways. And it doesn't very much matter what you print as long as you go on with that form of activity. One of the first examples McLuhan uses in his book, which speaks to this environmental perspective, is illumination, or light. As McLuhan puts it playfully, quote, The instance of electric light may prove illuminating in this connection. The electric light is pure information. It is a medium without a message, as it were, unless it is used to spell out some verbal ad or name, end quote. For McLuhan, light is pure information because it is a medium without an obvious message. Light extends our human capacities, especially in how it enables various activities and situations. For example, sporting events at night, 24-hour street trade. We might even think today about the moods facilitated by things like smart home lighting systems. These environmental conditions would not be possible without the medium of light, and yet we don't notice light as a medium until it is used to project another medium, such as film reels, or writing on transparency sheets, or digital graphics. This environmental or ecological view of media was important to another influential, if sometimes confusing, idea in understanding media, the notion of hot and cool media. McLuhan argued that some media, hot media, require less audience participation, less participation specifically of the senses. For McLuhan, hot media are high resolution or high definition. They are defined by precision, sequential nature, or a linear uh, logical progression. Most of all, they are defined by emphasizing one sense over others. For example, sight or sound above all else. Perhaps a little counterintuitively, this means for McLuhan that hot media are not only media such as print, but also radio, film, and photography. A form of hot media in a university setting might be a lecture. But then there are another form of media, by contrast, cool media. These media involve more audience participation, of the senses. Cool media are low definition. They require audiences to perceive more abstract patterns being presented to them, which they need to comprehend simultaneously using several senses. The main examples McLuhan provides of cool media are television and comics. A form of cool media in a university setting might be a seminar. But McLuhan found a perhaps more relatable tale about hot and cool media in electoral politics. Good evening. The television and radio stations of the United States and their affiliated stations are proud to provide facilities for a discussion of issues in the current political campaign by the two major candidates for the presidency. The candidates need no introduction. The Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. The 1960 American presidential debate was the first to be televised. It is often told that those who heard the debate on radio thought Nixon had come out the superior candidate. Meanwhile, those who saw the televised debate judged Kennedy the winner. McLuhan claimed that this was because Nixon had a well-developed private political message. Nixon was suited to radio, a hot medium, but not to television, a cool medium. Watch the first debate online on, on YouTube. Kennedy does appear visibly at ease. Well, Nixon looks somewhat nervous. He's sweating at times. He's shifty-eyed. He seems to be showing too much of his true feelings to the camera through expressions, gestures, and his embodied stances. These televised debates, and there were four in all, were not only seemed to have decided the election, but more broadly, revolutionized modern politics. 
Manchester, in the heart of the northwest of England, is tonight host to a British political first. I'm Alastair Stewart, and for the first time on British television, live in front of a representative studio audience, we'll be hearing from three men, each hoping to be the leader of the next UK government in the first election debate. In 2010, the UK had its first televised prime minister's debate, 50 years after Nixon and Kennedy. At the time, and in successive elections since 2015, 2017, and 2019, UK political strategists have shown their awareness and anxieties about the uncertain fortunes televised debates can present for political candidates. The Conservative Party has opted out of many of these debates. The rough calculation is something like, suffer the shame of not participating, but be shielded from the camera's glare and be able to point to the chaos of those that do take part. Now, it's not all that clear that the hot-cool distinction works for all media, and particularly for contemporary media. Are internet-enabled technologies such as smartphones hot or cool? And what about high-definition television? Smartphones, as well as HDTVs, involve the convergence of multiple media, so they potentially bring together cool and hot media, maybe into a kind of synthesis. Think about your own situation right now, listening to this podcast. Is this a hot media listening situation? A precision, linear and logical, sequential progression? Well, it probably depends on how you're listening. You might be in deep reflection, seated comfortably, listening with headphones, gazing at the sky outside your window. But on the other hand, you might be more distracted, washing up dishes, with this playing over the small speaker on your smartphone, competing with other noise. McLuhan would probably argue that it's not just these immediate micro-environmental circumstances that make a medium hot or cool. No, he'd say it's about the long-term, historical, and widespread spatial implications of podcasting. But even then, podcasting is hard to delineate. It's a complex coming together of many processes. Audio recording, digital sound compression, the internet, social media, and more. And this hits at some of the limits of medium theory when we start speaking of computation and network media in particular. But let's leave that particular problem aside for a future episode. Raymond Williams was a Welsh academic, novelist, and public intellectual. A Marxist thinker, he was associated with the New Left and the Birmingham School of Cultural Studies. He is often, a little oversimplistically, seen as offering a humanist or cultural perspective that contrasts with the technicist perspective of McLuhan and medium theory more generally. William's 1974 book, Television, Technology, and Cultural Form, is generally regarded as a direct, if not always explicit, response to McLuhan's understanding media. It argues that work such as McLuhan's falls back on a simple cause and effect relation between a medium and society. As Williams argues, quote, all questions about cause and effect, as between a technology and a society, are intensely practical. Until we have begun to answer them, we do not really know, in any particular case, whether, for example, we are talking about a technology or the uses of a technology, about necessary institutions or particular and changeable institutions, about a content or about a form. For Williams, merely stipulating that particular mediums bring about societal or human effects is far too simplistic. It bypasses real cultural and societal debates about the implications of a medium such as television. It reduces everything that happens in relation to media as effects caused by the characteristics of a given medium. Williams agreed that there is a value to understanding the characteristics of specific media, but his point was that McLuhan took this too far. McLuhan's approach essentially linked technological mediums with subconscious psychic effects, psychic effects that were apparently unable to grasp or adjust. According to Williams, this leaves McLuhan with a thin political solution, a situation in which the only response is, quote, the allocation and rationing of particular media for particular psychic effects, which he, McLuhan, believes would dissolve or control any problem that arises. There seems to be a problem running in parallel to these apparent divides in 1960s and 70s media and cultural studies. And this is the problem around how we define technology. When we invoke this word technology, Just what do we mean anyway? Well, first of all, we often seem to conflate technology with the new. For example, there's this tool called Google Books Ngram Viewer. It plots the frequency of any particular word or search string in sources printed between 1500 and the present year. If you enter the word technology, you'll see that the term has this strong upswing in usage in published works beginning in the 1960s and continuing to the present. 
So in other words, technology as a word has tended to be used more and more during this time when we've seen the rise of electronics, computers, the internet, space travel, artificial intelligence, and so on. David Edgerton, an economic historian, makes a strong argument against equating technology with the new. In his book, The Shock of the Old, Edgerton says technology is not just what is new or soon to come. It is also what is old, from the past, or still sticking around with us today. And if you take this more open-ended view of technology, Edgerton argues, it can open up surprises. For example, steam power is usually seen as an antiquated 19th century technology. But steam technology was more important in 1900 than 1800, and Britain consumed more coal in absolute terms in 1950 than 1850. An analogy here is that while today we fixate on social media, data from the media regulator Ofcom shows that most people in the UK still get the majority of their information from television. Aside from conflating technology with the new, however, there is a deeper problem. Conflating technology with things. And specifically, with things that we regard as distinct from us. This tends to lead us to think that there are technological things and then the use of those things. That there is something called technology and then there's something called culture. That there is technology and then there are humans. <laughs> Ursula Franklin was a German-Canadian metallurgist and physicist. She influentially argued that we should see technologies in conjunction with their associated cultural conditions. Technology is not the sum of the artifacts of wheels and gears, of rails and electronic transmitters. For me, technology is a system. It entails far more than the individual material components. Technology involves organization, procedure, symbols, new words, equations, and most of all, it involves the mindset. This is generally the prevailing view established by scholars in the field of science and technology studies. Stephen Klein, writing in 1985, asked the simple question that we asked before. What do we mean when we talk about technology? His response is a loose typology of four main ways we might understand this term. Let's be open-minded and think these four ways through a technology which is not strictly media-related. Automobiles. The first way we think about technology, Klein says, is as hardware or artifacts as basically anything made by humans which does not occur naturally on Earth. So here we might think of the car as an inorganic artifact, a material thing or object in the world. But technology, says Klein, might secondly be understood as a socio-technical system of manufacture. Here we might think of the car assembly line, a technological process with specific machines, robotics, operators, computers, and infrastructural dependencies like water or electricity. And then we might thirdly remember, Klein says, that technology can also mean a knowledge system. It might refer to information, skills, know-how, processes, and procedures for accomplishing tasks and getting specific things accomplished. And so here we might think of the car design office, part of a broader set of knowledges and techniques and know-how and methods that involves engineers, designers, accountants, managers, and others. But there is a final important sense of technology to consider. Technology can fourthly be seen as a socio-technical system of use. And this is the basis of what is actually done with the hardware after it is manufactured. A socio-technical system of use is crucial if the technology is to work as intended. A car needs to be driven. And here we might think about driving as an embodied practice, as an irreducible relationship between driver and vehicle. Of course, in focusing on this question about what we mean by technology, we may avoid another question. This is, what does it mean to be human? Let's not pretend that we can answer this massive philosophical question in the next five minutes, but it's an important question to begin asking at least. So just for a moment, let's return to McLuhan. McLuhan's most basic definition of media is as extensions of the senses. They extend humans as individual creatures, but also collectively as societies or cultures. This is a pretty broad definition of media. McLuhan, it seems, wants to position a technology like television in a long line of technologies, not just media technologies, but things like primitive tools, the controlled use of fire, writing systems, and so on. Maybe also shoes, which literary scholar Randy Laced remarked are significant not for, quote, the way they look or what they do, but how they affect my mobility, my freedom, and therefore my being, end quote. Neil Gaiman's poem, The Mushroom Hunters, adds a useful feminist perspective. Here's a passage. 
Before the flint club, or flint butcher's tools, the first tool of all was the sling for the baby to keep our hands free. McLuhan's broad sense of media is in the same broad camp as what we might label a post-human perspective. This is a perspective in which technologies are understood as patheses. In their book, Life After New Media, Sarah Kember and Joanna Zielinska adopt a broadly post-human perspective. They do so to move beyond what they call the technicist-humanist binary that goes alongside the frequent juxtaposition of Marshall McLuhan and Raymond Williams, a juxtaposition I've also made here. Kember and Zielinska suggest that, instead of media, we should think in terms of mediation. This term is meant not only to question technology or media and what they are, but also what it means to be human. As they say, quote, we human users of technology are not entirely distinct from our tools. They are not the means to our ends. Instead, they have become part of us, to an extent that the us-them distinction is no longer tenable, end quote. This is a post-human view because it questions the purity of the human. It's a view that's going to be important in this podcast, and especially for the students taking the course to which this podcast is partly directed. The idea of the post-human, or of an impure humanity, basically is one in which we are all perhaps something like cyborgs, an assemblage of human biology and artificial technologies. The cyborg was the model of humanity put forward by Donna Haraway in her 1985 Cyborg Manifesto. In this essay, the cyborg is described as a 20th century hybrid in which boundaries are broken down between human and animal, animal, human and machine, and physical and non-physical. For Haraway, this presents a challenge to radical feminism, which, she argues, too often relies on naturalist or essentialist notions of gender. Another prominent thinker in a broadly post-humanist vein is Bernard Stiegler. When he passed away in August 2020, Stiegler had become perhaps the best-known French philosopher of digital technology. Some journey since the late 1970s when Stiegler was incarcerated for armed robbery and discovered philosophy. Stiegler's best-known book is Technics in Time 1, the first of a trilogy published in 1994 and translated into English in 1998. It's a wide-ranging discussion that takes in a range of philosophers, thinkers, and also Greek mythology. It argues that philosophy has long suppressed the importance of what Stiegler calls technics. Technology, Stiegler is saying, has long been treated as subsequent to humanity. As a response, Stiegler proposes that technicity is originary, that the very genesis of humanity is defined by a body technics relationship. So for Stiegler, technics and culture are not opposed, but rather technics is the condition of culture. In her 2007 book, How We Think, Catherine Hales makes a similar argument using the concept of technogenesis. Technogenesis likewise argues that the human species is defined by its co-evolution with tools and technologies. The inside, Hale says, is always already contaminated by the outside, technics. This reiterates the main point we've been working through here, that the technological and cultural aspects of media are in a chicken and egg relationship, an irreducible relationship, a relationship that we'll explore further in the episodes to come. Until then, I'm Scott Rogers, and you've been listening to Media Technology and Culture. <laughs>